Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. And this is week seven of an eight week series. And Lord willing, the final week uh, of the series will be next Sunday. And it is going to be an interesting time. Um, I, I'm still putting together the information that I'm going to present to you uh, on that day. Um, but uh, I look forward to it, and I hope that it will be uh, helpful uh, to you and to those uh, people who choose to uh, view us online. Uh, it's, I mean, it truly is amazing that, that we attend a church that, on any given Sunday morning, we have between 100 and 115 people, and yet we are reaching thousands and thousands of people every week on the internet. That just, that just boggles my mind to, to think about it. So, uh, this is Power to Stand, uh, a class that Pastor Steve and I uh, team teach, and Today, we're looking at the topic of the day of the Lord, Noah, Lot, and the Son of Man. Noah, Lot, and the Son of Man. So we're going to be spending the vast majority of our time in the gospel uh, accounts this morning. Last week, we took a look at Paul and the day of the Lord. We concentrated our focus... Uh, during uh, Power to Stand last week on the first and second epistles to the Thessalonians. And I suggested to you, in light of multiple passages uh, in those two books, that, that Paul taught exactly what Jesus did. Namely, that the resurrection and the rapture would take place prior to the day of the Lord but that the resurrection and the rapture would happen on the same day that the day of the Lord begins. I believe Jesus taught that, and, and we're going to see that this morning. I also believe that Paul taught that, uh, as well as the rest of the apostles. And that is uh, the, the teaching in the New Testament, again, as, as I understand and interpret it. Okay, so let's move on and take a look at what Jesus had to say about Noah, Lot, and the Son of Man. And we're going to begin in the chapter that preceded the passage that I preached on in the first hour this morning. I alluded to it briefly, but it's the passage regarding uh, Jesus' uh, second coming and the kingdom uh, of God. Now, we're going to begin in verses 20 and 21 instead of verse 22 because there's some important contrasts that I need to make between Jesus' teaching on eschatology or the doctrine of last things to unbelievers and His teaching on eschatology or the doctrine of last things to believers. He told, he told them different things. And if you would read these verses... Um, one after another and not recognize and understand the context and not make the distinction, you would draw the conclusion that Jesus Christ is contradicting himself. And if he contradicts himself, he cannot be God. And if he is not God, then we are doomed and lost for all eternity. So this distinction is important, and I'm going to take the time to make it. So uh, I, I want you to listen carefully as we look at these first two verses. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. So it's the Pharisees who are asking the question. Everybody understand? The Pharisees are asking the question. He answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. But later on, when he teaches his disciples, he's going to talk about the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. For just as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So, with regard to the scribes and the Pharisees, he's, he's saying the kingdom, the, the kingdom of God um, 
is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. Now, I want you to notice in your Bibles, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to, to be observed. And then in verse 24, he quotes the same passage that, or the, he shares the same teaching that he shared as recorded in Matthew chapter 24 uh, when, when talking about his, uh, his second coming. For just as the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. It will be dramatic. It will be swift. It will be visible. Just like lightning flashing against the sky. It, it will capture the visual attention of people on planet Earth on that day. Now he also says to the Pharisees, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. But look at what he says to the disciples in verses 22 and 23. The day shall come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, look here. He's saying exactly the opposite of what he just said to the Pharisees. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you why I think he said that. And it makes sense to me. It's theologically consistent with the rest of the New Testament, as far as I know. And it explains why Jesus gives different answers and perspectives to different groups of people. Namely, unbelievers on the one hand and believers on the other. The kingdom of God, this is back again in verse 20, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. So in other words, for unbelievers, they will not recognize the signs of His coming. There are signs of His coming. We've already studied them, have we not? There's the sign of the cosmic disturbances. Joel chapter 2, which is cited in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Acts chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 6. There's the sign of the coming of Elijah which is predicted in Malachi chapter 4, the last several verses of the last chapter in our English Bibles. And we studied that several weeks ago. Then last week we took a look at the signs that, that Paul talks about. That the, that the day of the Lord and our gathering together to Him, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, will not precede the great falling away by the professing church, there's going to be a great apostasy. People who say they believe in God are going to fall away from God in droves. It will happen. It's predicted in Scripture. God has declared it. He knows the end from the beginning. And secondly, the, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the son of perdition, the person that we call Antichrist, he will be revealed. And we're told in the context of that chapter that he will be revealed when he takes his seat in the temple in Jerusalem and declares himself to be God. Well, we believe at FBC that that event is describing the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Okay, so for unbelievers, they're not going to recognize the signs of the times. The, these things will happen, but they will not repent. These things will happen declaring that Jesus is, is returning soon, and they will pay no attention whatsoever. They will continue on in their unbelief. if they refuse to believe in the truth, so as to be saved. So he says, for unbelievers, there's no signs because you won't recognize them. And, and, and unbelievers are not going to say, you know, here he is, there he is, right? Because they're not looking for him. But then he says, Behold, 
The kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, I want to suggest to you this morning that this is one of the most misinterpreted passages on the, the kingdom of God found anywhere in the Bible. Sometimes this verse is translated, you know, in, in, in various versions, the kingdom of God is in you, or the kingdom of God is within you. That makes absolutely no sense, does it not? Who is he speaking to? The Pharisees. He's speaking to unbelieving religious Jewish leaders of the day. He's not saying the kingdom of, of God is within you. He calls them to repent. He says, woe to them. Seven different times in Matthew chapter 23 before he delivers the Olivet Discourse teaching in Matthew 24 and 25. He's talking to unbelievers. And he says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Not in you, not within you, in your midst. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the king. I am physically present. You need to repent and believe in me. You need to recognize my authority as the anointed one, as the authorized, promised one of God, as the one who will, who will reign as king and sit on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem, reigning over the entire earth, reigning over a kingdom that will have no end. The kingdom of God is in your midst because I am here. I am the king. I believe, and again, this is my opinion, that if as the leaders of the Jewish nation, the scribes and the Pharisees as a group, not individual exceptions like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, but the entire Sanhedrin, had they placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, had they announced to the nation of Israel that Messiah had come, then that would have become the remnant nation of Israel, predicted and prophesied in Scripture. But we know they didn't. They rejected Jesus' authority. They did not believe his claims. They put him to death because he was a challenge to their authority. The kingdom of God is in your midst. I am king, I am here, I am standing in front of your faces. You should bow down and worship me because I am your creator God. But they did not. Okay. Did I make the point? Let's move on to the disciples. He makes a distinction. Now he's going to talk to the disciples. He's talking to followers. He's talking to believers. He said to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here, do not go away, do not run after them. In other words, he's warning his followers, don't listen to people who say, that I've come. When I come, you will know it. You will know it like lightning flashing from one end of the sky to another. It will be dramatic. It will be visible. It will be intense. It will be swift. It will happen. Don't listen if they say he's in this city or he's in, in that building, or in that location, because that's a false Christ. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. That lines up perfectly with his teaching in the Olivet Discourse. Don't be misled. Don't be deceived by false teachers, false prophets, false Christs. And be ready and alert. Be prepared for my return. Principles that we've been emphasizing throughout this series on the day of the Lord. 
Do not go away, do not run after them, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Isn't that interesting? The way that Jesus phrases that. In his day. Okay, let's continue. Luke 17. But first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So he's predicting his, his death. And obviously we know from Scripture and from history his subsequent burial and resurrection. And just as it happened in the days of Noah. So now he's introducing the figure of Noah. Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. It'll be just like Noah. It'll be just like Noah in the time leading up to the return of Jesus Christ for his bride. It'll be just like it. They were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying. They were being given in marriage. Now, some people interpret this as gluttony and drunkenness and um, unbiblical forms of marriage. And and. Certainly that will be happening in those days. But the language used here is describing ordinary, everyday activity. Eating, drinking, getting married, having families. And as people go about their ordinary activities, whether they're drunk, gluttonous and participating in fornication or not, they're going to be unprepared. That's the point. That happened until the day that Noah entered the ark. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. Let me say it again. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, in Genesis chapter 7, uh, there is a detailed description of, obviously, the flood account and uh, the rain and the subterranean floodwaters and, and all of the things that transpired. And there are some people who have interpreted that there's a seven-day period when Noah goes into the ark with his family and then the waters come. A careful reading of the text will indicate, and I, th I believe it's clear, will indicate that the flood waters started, that the rain started on the very day that Noah entered the ark. Let me read for you just three of the verses that I've listed in this um, related passage. Genesis chapter 7, and I'm going to read for you, I believe, verses 11 to 13, if memory serves me correctly. Yes, verses 11 to 13, Genesis chapter 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, tells us the year, in the second month, Tells us the month. On the 17th day of the month, tells us the day, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the skies were open. Do you all see? He's talking about the flood commencing. And it began on that day. The flood commenced. And the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. On the very same day, the floodgates were open. And on that day they entered the ark, look at what God did. Into verse 16. And the Lord closed it behind him. He shut the door, and then the waters came. 
I think the text is clear. All right? So, back to Luke 17 in our slide. They were doing these things, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So Noah and his family entered into a place of deliverance and rescue, and then judgment comes, judgment falls. So you have the example of Noah. Jesus now talks about Lot. Now, it's important... It's important that we interpret Matthew 24, which also talks about the days of Noah. And it has similar terminology as Luke 17. It's important that we interpret Matthew 24 in light of Luke 17. Because it's a fuller account. It gives us more material. And one of our principles of biblical interpretation, you interpret the less clear or the less full passages in light of the more clear or the more extensive, <laughs> easy for me to say, extensive passages. Thank you very much. All right. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. Now, this is the, this is the, the coming of the Son of Man now that he's talking about. This is the return of Christ. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. Okay? Everyday life activities. Granted, (laughs) it's Sodom and Gomorrah. Rampant fornication. Rampant sexual immorality of various kinds. But on the day... On the day that Lot went out from Sodom, the very same day Lot was rescued, on the day Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all, destroyed all of the residents of Sodom that remained behind. Every last person was judged by God. Now, verse 30, it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Do you understand that the biblical flood and the account of of Sodom and Gomorrah are pictures of the coming judgment of God, the coming wrath of God? And Jesus says that just as it was in the days of Noah, just as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And again, you know, I, I don't want to belabor this because it, you know, it's clear in the text, but it uses very specific terminology. But on the same day, but on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone. On the day that Noah entered the ark with his family, the floodwaters came. On the same day. That's the principle that Jesus is teaching. This is what he's warning about. When I come for my people, it will be followed immediately by judgment on those who have chosen, who have chosen to deny the truth so as to be saved. All right, let's continue. On that day, the one who's on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. Likewise, the one who's in the field must not turn back. If I were you, and I'm not, but if I were, I would take a pen or a pencil and underline that verse. It's a short verse. Luke 17, 32. Three words. Remember Lot's wife. Wow. Is that ever powerful in in light of the context? Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. So, do you ever read the Bible, and especially the teachings of Jesus, and you, you read them, and then you scratch your head, and you go, wow, that's hard to understand. 
I, I don't get it. I mean, whoever seeks to lose his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. What's that mean? It's in the context of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's just said, remember Lot's wife. Now let's look at this phrase that sometimes is difficult and, and complex and or maybe, maybe confusing to some of us. Let's look at it in light of Lot's wife. What did Lot's wife do? She was instructed, go with the angels. The angels are going to take you to a place of safety. They're going to take you to a place of rescue. You're going to be delivered. Go with the angels. Don't stay in the city. And don't look back. What did she do? Tell her her soul, right? Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life, what did she do? She sought to keep her life in Sodom. She lost it. What did Lot do and his family? Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Lot lost his life in Sodom so that it might be preserved as the angels rescued him from destruction. That's the principle. That's the point. Remember Lot's wife. Okay, let's continue. I tell you on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. And answering they said to him, Where, Lord? He said to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Now, here's the interesting thing for me. One of the interesting things. In Luke 17, we have two prophetic markers that connect to the text of Matthew 24. A total, totally different gospel writer. Okay. Matthew 24 is uh, the start of the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew 24, as in Luke 17, you have not only for just as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, but you also have where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Those are the only two places in the Bible that I'm aware of where those verses occur, and they're in the exact same context, the context of the teaching on the return of the Son of Man. Now, in Matthew 24, it's often taught, it's often taught that this analogy of the two people, you know, being in a field, uh, or two people being uh, in bed, you know, one one is taken and one is left. You know, there, there are there are some interpretations that would would take the approach that the one taken. The one taken, that's bad. That's the one taken into judgment. The one left, that's good. That's the one left to enter into the kingdom. Now, I personally do not believe that. I believe that the passage is actually stating what the text seems to be saying in, in, in the natural flow and context of the passage. And that is, the one who is taken is rescued and the one who is left is left for judgment. Think Noah and the flood. The one taken in the ark, rescued. The ones left, judgment and wrath of God. Think Lot. The ones who followed the angels, rescued. The ones who stayed behind in Sodom and Gomorrah, judged by the wrath of God. Just the, the same. Now, I'm going to share with you why some people are confused on this uh, when we get to Matthew chapter 24, but I just want to put it out there that, that I personally don't hold that view, although there are good men and women who love God, who are serving Jesus, who are rightly related to the Lord, who I have the utmost respect for who hold that position. Just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't make them a false teacher, doesn't, doesn't 
automatically make them a heretic. Okay? Now, we should study these things and we should discuss these things and if necessary, we should have godly, biblical exchange and debate. But please, let's treat each other for what we are if we're brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're brothers and sisters, let's treat each other like family. And the exception to that is, of course, if someone is knowingly walking in sin and refusing to repent. That's the one exception. All right. Here's the passage that I preached on in the first hour. And this is the slide that I believe the Spirit of God prompted me in my mind to think, maybe I ought to preach on Luke 18, which is what I did. So I'm just going to read it and not comment it. And if you want to know what I believe about that passage, you've got to listen to another message. (laughs) And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long, uh, long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. Praise God, hallelujah. From the lips of Jesus Christ himself regarding the faithfulness of God the Father. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I believe that he will. And the faith that he finds will be the faithful remnant who pray at all times and do not lose heart. All right. Here is the passage that has led to some measure of confusion. Matthew chapter 24. So this is, is kind of like a parallel passage. You know, Jesus, Jesus is teaching about, <clears throat> you know, the return of the Son of Man. And he says of that day and hour, no one knows. And he then begins to talk about Noah. So I'm going to read this whole passage, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, and I'm going to point to where the confusion comes, where the confusion comes. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Sounds like Luke 17, doesn't it? Yeah, sounds a lot like Luke 17. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, my, my translation says, the New American Standard. Okay? So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that phrase, took them all away, from my perspective, point of view, uh, from, a, from a human perspective, I look at this particular translation as unfortunate because of what follows, okay? Because it leads to confusion. This this word took them all away. It, It should be translated something like the flood came and swept them all away because that's what floods do. It swept them all away. And it, you know, it can mean that. But by translating it simply took them all away, in in my translation, it leads to some confusion because the next verses talk about there will be two men left in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Well, the one that's taken is the one that's taken in the judgment of the flood. It's a totally different word in the original. Not the same word. It's a word that means taken in judgment. The other, you know, the other word, the word that's translated left, that's talking about those who will be left for judgment. The ones who are taken, they are rescued. They are delivered. You know, that's, that's one of the primary senses and, 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 and meanings of this particular word. This is talking about the resurrection and the rapture. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. You know, it's not talking about 
the ones who are uh, taken are taken into judgment. The ones who are left, you know, enter the kingdom. Because he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man, and it's the days of Noah, and he's talking about the day of the Lord. And if, you know, if you see this as entering into the kingdom, when does the day of the Lord transpire? You know, you got a real problem. No time. One of the trumpets of the day of the Lord, God's wrath lasts for five months. All right. So then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be ready, be prepared. So in other words, going back to the previous slide, if I can, okay. Until the flood came and took them away. If you just, in your mind, change that. The flood came and swept them away. And, and then that way you're not going to think, oh, the take in verse 39 is the same as the take in the verses following. No, it's not. Totally different word, totally different meaning. The flood is sweeping them away. The one taken is rescued. The one left is left for judgment. All right. I think I made the point there. So therefore, be on the alert. Look how Jerry did that. Be alert. Look at that slide. Therefore, be on the alert. Was it the one before? Yes. Look at that. Be alert. Oh, there it is again. Be alert. Okay, now I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so therefore, be on the alert. Chapter 24, verses 43 and 44. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would not have been on the alert. Or excuse me, he would have been on the alert if he'd have known, but he didn't know because he wasn't prepared and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready because the coming of the Son of Man is going to be like a thief in the night. And the, the point is, that's being illustrated is, the people who aren't ready will be caught unaware. That's the whole point. It's not, you know, can we figure out when Jesus is coming back? That's not the point. The point is, we need to be ready when he does come. We need to be watching. We need to be alert. We need to be spiritually attuned. We should not be deceived. We need to be in the Scriptures. We need to be in prayer. We need to be following the lead of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. Chapter 25, verse 13. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day of the hour. Does it sound like a pattern here that Jesus is giving in the Olivet Discourse? Be ready, because you don't know. Be ready because you don't know. Mark 13, this is Mark's account. But of that day or hour, no one knows. Verse 33, take heed. Keep on the alert. You know, this is Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse. And then he concludes, this, this is really strong. I love this paragraph. I'm going to read the whole thing because I like it so much. But I'm going to drink two sips of water before I read it. Mark 13, 35 to 37. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all be on the alert, exclamation point. By the way, that's in the text of my translation. Luke 21. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up your heads, lift up your heads, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. So when we see these things happening, we should be encouraged. Will it be in, in dark, difficult days? Yes. 
But be encouraged. Jesus is coming. Throughout church history, did not faithful followers and believers in Jesus Christ lose their lives? Were not some of them beheaded? Were not some of them burned at the stake? Yes. You know, since the first century, people have died for their faith in Jesus Christ. What did we read in the call to worship passage this morning from from uh, Revelation, or excuse me, Romans chapter 8? You know, shall, shall tribulation or, or death or, or the sword separate us from the love of Christ? No, we don't have to be afraid. Is it scary? Yes, but we don't have to be afraid. Jesus consistently said to his followers who would die for their faith, do not be afraid. Fear not. Let not your hearts be troubled. If we're fearful, that's the, that's the weapon of the enemy against us. Now again, I'm, I understand it's hard when difficult times come. It, it's hard to be afflicted for your faith. It's hard to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. I understand that. Satan and the forces of darkness want to use that as a weapon to encourage us to not be bold in our testimony, to not stand up for the truth. Luke 21, 34 to 36. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. That's the start of the day of the Lord. And again, that's the phrase that the Apostle John uses for unbelievers, earth dwellers, in the book of Revelation. Every case that it's used, I think it occurs nine times or so, uh, it's used in the context of the wrath of God being poured out. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Man. Isn't that great? Keep alert. Pray at all times. Sounds like what we learned in... Luke 18 this morning, right? Okay. So here it is. This is the conclusion. What, what time's that clock say? Quarter till? Wow. I've been speaking for over 40 minutes. Amazing. <laughs> you, know, I got, you know, I got to this slide and I thought, oh, I'm almost done. You know, it must be about 1220. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so this is, the, this is the call to worship passage. So, you know, I read it before the morning message. Now I'm going to read it after the power to stand teaching. And, and I want you to notice how applicable these words are for the believer who desire, believers who desire to pray at all times and to not lose heart. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Okay. What's the answer to that question? If God is on your side, who is against us? Okay, Satan's against us, but what's the answer in light of the fact that Satan's against us? Yeah, if God's for us, it doesn't matter that Satan is against us. He's against us. He wants to kill us. He wants to destroy us, but it doesn't matter. All he can do is kill the body. He can't touch our soul and our spirit. He can't touch our relationship to God. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, in in the big picture of things, in light of eternity, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. We will face opposition. Jesus promised that. The world hated me. It's going to hate you. I mean, Jesus laid that out very clearly. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, 
how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's almost like an all the more passage, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if, if God gave, gave us Jesus, how, how will he not give us all things? He gave us the best thing he could give, his unique one-of-a-kind son. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, who does that? Who brings a charge against us? Satan. Forces of darkness. They go before God, and Satan is identified as the accuser of the brethren in Revelation chapter 12. Who will bring a charge against God, God's elect? Satan will. But guess what? It doesn't matter, and here's why. God is the one who justifies. Jesus Christ is our advocate or defense attorney. Satan will bring a charge, and Jesus will have it thrown out of court, and... The Father will declare not guilty because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Who is the one who condemns? Again, Satan and the forces of darkness. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Again, we belong to him. Satan can, can go before God and condemn us all he wants. It's not going to change the fact that we have been forgiven and we've received the gift of eternal life. Not only is he at the right hand of God, but he also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, just as it is written? And by the way, the answer to that is none of those things. For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. Boy, that's a cheery passage from the Old Testament, right? For your sake, for your sake, for your sake, we are being put to death. Are you willing to die for God? I mean, that's a question believers need to, to answer. For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. Not that we will die, but are you willing to die for your faith? We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Sounds like Revelation in the seven churches, doesn't it? To the one who overcomes, I will give. To he who overcomes, I will give. All these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God who is our creator, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. By the way, for those of you who may have prayed for me between the first hour and the second hour, may God bless you. And praise the Lord that we're at the end of Power to Stand for Q&A, and I'm still standing. Uh, that's God's grace. All right, so we, do we have questions? Just observation. Um, Young's literal translation, which is a good literal translation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make much sense in the English language, but a lot of times the... Um, Matthew 24, 38, uh, 39, actually, you talked about taking and taking, basically. Mm -hmm. and this translation actually says, took all away, and then it said, one in the field, one is received. Yeah. I love that. So yeah. it changes the whole narrative. He says, come to me, instead of taking them and, you know, pushing them away. So yeah. it kind of clears that up a little bit better. Okay. Another question. Or comment, you all want to get out of here early and go to lunch. Um, in the story of Noah, when you talked about the confusion where people think the flood started seven right. days, verse 10 is where they get that from. 
because it says seven days. Oh, right, yeah. The, yeah. The, and, that's and, where they get the confusion. Right, and the seven days is not seven days Noah and his family are in the ark. The seven days are the animals coming and gathering so that they might be herded onto the ark. That's where they get the confusion. Right. Yeah, that's Genesis chapter 7, verse 10, which is the verse before the three verses that I read uh, in an attempt to uh, explain the confusion in Matthew 24. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's pray and uh, thank God uh, for this time. Remember to pray for uh, Pastor Steve and his family in Indiana as they're ministering uh, to extended family uh, in uh, the death of Pastor Steve's brother's wife's father. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and for this day and um, we are amazed at your word and the promises that are contained in it. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you that your word and your spirit are sufficient for all things in the Christian life. And for some down through the ages, Father, the Christian life terminated in martyrdom. And your word and your spirit were sufficient at that moment as well. And we take courage in that, Father, we take comfort in that, and we pray that we might not be deceived and that we might be ready and prepared for the return of Jesus Christ in the air to receive his bride. Father, we look forward to the coming of the Son of Man in power and glory. And we, along with the scriptures, say, even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen.